Hello, 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 and welcome to Code Rhetoric with Tam Chalk. This is your girl and your host, Tamara Abraham, founder of Abraham Medical Coding Coach. So on today's episode of Code Rhetoric with Tam Talk, I would like to share some tips and strategies for landing your coding gig. So um, as a coach, as well as a mentor and coding instructor, I often get the question on how can I land my first coding gig or how can I just break out into a, a, a coding role um, as a coder? So I decided to share some tips, um, strategies, and probably personal tips of mine um, with you all. And again, I will be coming or I will be sharing my perspective from someone who's done some hiring as well as someone who, as a coder, as an employee. So we look at it as the higher R and the higher E. So there's possibly like four things or four strategies that I would like to share with you all and they kind of intertwine with each role or each perspective and so it depends on the individual and how they apply these tips. So I'm going to speak on the perspective of someone, uh, the higher, the, the manager, the leader, coding leadership, the integral, what I look for as a leader for someone to be a potential coding um, employee. So the first thing that I look for is professionalism, professionalism in uh, their punctuality for the interview. Did they show up on time? Were they late? Um, did they show up early? Um, I look for their appearance. Although uh, with coding, especially now that we're remote, I guess the appearance, your dress code. But for those who are still in the office setting, you need to make sure you have a professional dress code. Um, you don't have to dress like in business attire, but you do want to um, be professional. You know, your clothes are, are, are iron or, you know, are neat in your hair as well as your, um, just your overall appearance needs to be uh, professional. And then I also look for experience. I know a lot of the coding students or newly coding um, individuals are probably like, well, I don't have experience. So I'm going to speak to the, the, the issue or the, address the issue of experience. I look for experience. And the reason why I say I look for experience because depending on the coding role that an individual is applying for, you want to make sure that that, that, applicant, that applicant has um the right amount of experience. Not that a new coder can't be trained or as well as an old coder can be trained, but you want to make sure they have some some form of experience. One of the things that I've noticed um, as an, uh, a hiring individual, a hiring uh, manager, when I review uh, applications as well as resumes, I, can, uh, I notice there's been some fluffing of experience or skill set. There's also been some copying and pasting of job descriptions from other um, employers into the resume. And and I truth be told, as a manager, not just me, but there are other leaders out there as well. We are able to determine or tell from just looking at your resume um, whether or not you you have padded or you're padding your resume to make up or, or, or I would say justify your lack of experience in the coding world. And you don't have to do that. So for those who are new to coding and you're trying to determine how can I, you know, come with some experience or justify that I, I have experience or I'm, I'm capable of uh, performing the job duties. Um, one thing that I, I share with my uh, coding students is to take a look at your scores, like from your, if you took training or you took a course and you were graded, look at those areas where you scored the highest. And then when you took the certification exam, look at those scores as well and see which areas or which specialties uh, uh, where you scored the highest. And that could be your experience in a sense. Um, you can speak to those high grade marks um, in your interview. Say, for example, you may not have done well 
in the evaluation and management component or service of uh, section, excuse me, of the exam, but you may have scored very well or very high in, say, cardiology. So um, you can speak to your high marks or your high grades in the cardiology uh, specialty and say, hey, you know, I, I did very well in, in this particular section, so I think I have a really good grasp on coding cardiology. And so I would recommend just speaking to your high marks in your course training as well as your um, high marks that you received on your exam, your certification exam. So again, um, professionalism, just making sure you're punctual, um, have excellent oral and written communication skills, um, make sure you have time management skills, and making sure, again, if you're, um, your, your job is in the office or if you're going to be interviewing personally, face-to-face, -face, I would recommend that you uh, dress professionally and um, also with that experience. And also keep in mind, as a coder, we all have to start somewhere. Whether you're observing um, a seasoned coder or a subject matter expert in the coding arena, do realize that we all had to start somewhere. Um, we all had to start in the beginning and we worked our way up. And to be honest, and I know a lot of individuals pursue coding because of the remote work, um, work arrangement. Keep in mind that coding wasn't always remote. Um, it wasn't always remote. I can recall a time where I had to somewhat plead with my business office director to work um, in the afternoon because my kids' school, it was the beginning of the school year and their busing system wasn't quite where it needed to be. So parents had to come pick their children up from school. So I would work in the office in the morning and then I would go pick up my, my children from school, and then work the rest of my shift from home. And so, and, and again, I had to really just like write a pitch to my director justifying why it would be beneficial for me as a coder to work remote. And so, again, coding wasn't always remote. So this is, is, is fairly new. Um, but we, like I said, but other than that, we all started in the office setting. And so I always recommend to a new coder, if possible, to always start in the office setting. And the reason for that is you want to make sure you, um, well, one, you're going to be able to network with other coders, season or new coders as well. You'll be able to learn. You'll be able to interact with the uh, providers. Uh, you'll be able to learn some other things you other um, things that you did not pick up in your, cor your course or your training. And you'll be able to learn other specialties or subspecialties. For example, I always also always recommend that a coder start off maybe like in primary care or internal medicine because you get a touch of some of those subspecialties like the ologies. I call them the ologies, like cardiology, gastroenterology. You get a taste of the ologies. And then you're able to determine your next move. So, for example, if you've able to touch on those different areas or different ologies, you're able to make a decision on your next step. Like, OK, I um, again with cardiology, I've had experience. I was able to work with cardiology. I was able to see what it what it all entails. And I think I want to um, continue to pursue um, coding in cardiology. So. There you go. So this is why I recommend that you get into um, the office setting and, and, again, recommend that you start with internal medicine because it gives you a true picture of how the whole revenue cycle works, especially as it relates to the coding piece of it. So I would encourage you to do so. But, and it is a big but, but again, because of the pandemic or our current situation, a lot of us are remote. So what does that mean? So this is where, again, where um, those traits that I mentioned earlier would need to come into play. You need to need to know if you have excellent time management skills. Um, are you a researcher? Are you good at researching? Uh, are your oral and written communication skills where they need to be? Because 
unlike just being remote doesn't mean that you're, you know, on an island by yourself. You still need to be able to interact or communicate with your colleagues, um, probably more so than when, when or if you were in an office setting. Um, time management. You have to make sure your time management is on point. How how do you deal with distractions? Are you able to to work with limited or little distractions? Or um, and I know that some some of us our children are are virtual learners now. So how are you how are you managing that? So this is where those skills set that those skills or those character character traits are really going to have to. Um, come into play. And so if you're lacking in these areas, um, this would be a good time to start putting those great character or good character traits into practice. Another thing that I would recommend is networking. If you're part of the American Academy Professional Coders Association, also known as the AAPC, as well as AHIMA, you want to make sure you're networking. Networking um, through local chapter meetings, uh, coding conferences. If you know of any coders, um, if you're on social media, there are uh, closed groups, coding groups on there. You get in there and network. Um, ask questions, you know, have a business card. Uh, you know, share your information, share what you can bring, share your your experience and what you're looking for. Now, does that always uh, land you a coding gig? 50, 50, 50, you can say 50, 50 percent chance of um, meeting your uh, potential or future boss. So, again, I would recommend doing so. Um, and also in which I would say, speaking of networking, when you're meeting individuals in the industry, I always tell, um, and I what well, used to tell my um, coaching mentees, that the coding world is big, but the coding world is also small. And I'll repeat that. The coding world is big, but the coding world is also small. Because you may have worked with someone or you knew someone in the coding industry over on, I'm going to say on the South side, and then you meet someone uh, or another uh, coding expert on the North side and you don't know, you may never know that those two individuals know each other, the South side individual as well as the North side individual. So it's very important that whether you had a bad experience with one coding uh, individual or coding manager or colleague that you do not take that negative information or you do not uh, share that negative information or your perspective of that individual with another coding expert. Again, because you don't know who they are and you don't know if they know each other. So I encourage that not to do that. Excuse me. So that is my perspective from a hiring manager's uh, view. And I'm now going to flip to that of a coder or an employee's view. And pretty much the things are the same. The same strategies that I shared about being a professional, having work experience, and then starting somewhere. It's the same thing. The only difference is the hirer or the, the coding leadership has the has the pen to make the decision, whereas the coder does not, well, you do have the decision. You may be offered the position and you may feel that, you know, you're not a good fit and it's okay to say, you know, I'm going to pass. However, but getting back to the strategies and tips, those are the same. And I've noticed this through the different roles that I've held in coding or I'm currently holding in coding, that is the same, uh, the same character, character traits. Again, when it comes to like that time management, that oral, and as well as that written communication, being professional, even though you're working remote, you still need to maintain a level of professionalism, especially when it comes to your communication. And then also that experience, uh, just making sure you have experience and, and your skill set or be truthful in your experience and skill set. Do not fabricate. Do not lie about your skill set because here's the thing. And I failed to mention this before. Every coding opportunity that you apply for, you will be uh, completing a coding assessment. 
And you may say, well, I, I have my certification. Why do I need to take another coding test or coding assessment? Here's why, because contrary to what we may believe, there are some individuals who will have someone else take their test for them. <laughs> Let me repeat that. There are individuals out there who will have another individual take their test for them. So we need to make sure as a, a hiring manager that you are able to do the job or perform the skills that you stated or you have listed on your resume or application. So I know that there's different ways that coding assessments are um, administered. Some are administered via email and, and the coder or coding applicant has a, uh, a certain time frame in which to get it completed. Another method is face-to-face. -face. Um, I've done them on, in all capacities, um, online, uh, timed, face-to-face, uh, -face, during a face-to-face -face interview session, and then uh, again, when I had the, the time frame, like uh, 48 hours to complete. So uh, that's how we're able to, again, assess your coding skills and then also weed out applicants. Let's say you have like 100 applicants applying for the same coding role. Well, we're going to go through uh, and look and, you know, through the applications or resumes, and we're going to select the ones that we feel that may be a potential fit. Then, of course, you be, you know, the interview as well as the coding assessment. Or you may get the coding assessment prior to the interview. So if you pass the coding assessment, then that may move you to the next phase of the interview process or the hiring process. And then there may be a time where you are interviewed and then you take the, the coding assessment and vice versa. So just know anytime you apply for a coding position, just be prepared to take a coding assessment. And you may have passed. You may pass, and I'll be honest, you may pass the coding assessment, but the individual that we're looking for may not, or your qualifications may not fit that particular role. However, there may be another role that, that, that is coming up or coming out, and you may be a potential fit for that one. And when I say potential fit, so someone may be looking for a cardiology coder. Um, yes, you're credentialed and you pass the test, but you, you may not have enough experience in cardiology. So then another role may come open and it is a cardiology or for, card for a cardiology coder and you have the skill set and the experience. So then you may receive a phone call to come in for another interview or maybe, you know, for hire, to hire. So again, just keep in mind those coding assessments. Um, again, just having those, those skill sets, again, with that time management and that, uh, you know, or written, written communication skill set. And I keep saying those things because it is very important that you have those traits. It is very important that you have those traits because coding has a productivity measure attached to it now. So you want to make sure your time management skills are on point. And then, again, because we are um, remote, um, you want to make sure, again, your oral and written communication skills are on point as well because that has increased. And if it hasn't increased for you, it will increase. So, again, these are some of the things that I've seen, I've noticed, again, in both roles, um, or capacities as a coder, these are the common things or the common threads or common tips or things that you would need to have as a coder. Um, and also, don't be discouraged. Just because you are you have the coding credentials doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be in a coding role. And what do I mean by that? You can do other things. Um, you can be a compliance auditor. You can be a clinical documentation improvement specialist. You may even have a degree in nursing. You can be a nurse and you just have that added knowledge of coding. Um, you may want to work in a different field outside of healthcare altogether, like the law, the legal aspect of healthcare. Or you can start your own business. 
uh, depending on your experience, um, your training, your skill set, you can possibly be a coach. You could possibly be, uh, you know, a coding instructor, all of those things. So you don't have to delegate yourself or really delegate yourself to a coding role. There are other things that you can do as a coder. Uh, take me, for example. Um, yes, take me, for example. I've been in coding for over 20 years. Um, I, like I said, I worked as a uh, compliance manager, compliance officer, uh, corporate compliance auditor, uh, coding supervisor, coding manager, um, specialized coder, contract coder, consultant, auditor. Like, so that I've tried everything or and, and am doing everything. And so because I have that vast knowledge of work experience, I am able to sit here and share with you about the do, the tips or the do's and don'ts when looking for a coding position. Now, since we're on that subject of, of, of experience and certifications, the next question is, do you have to have a certification for every area of coding that you want to pursue? I'm going to say no. You, do, you don't have to have all of the certifications to work in every area of coding. Why do I say that? Because I've worked in many areas of coding and I don't have the certification to do so. Now, that doesn't mean you just go and apply for a coding job and you don't have a certification, period. You have to have a certification, such as you have to have the CPC or I would say with uh, AHIMA, the CCS. You have to have the base certification or the main certification. But as far as the specialty certifications, you do not have to have that. Now, and then also that may depend on the employer, what they're requiring for you or requiring for the coders to have in order to work for them. For me, I, I worked in compliance for many years and the majority of my coding career has been in compliance. Do I have a credential in compliance? No, I do not. I've done some risk adjustment coding. Do I have a, a credential for risk adjustment coding? No, I do not. I've done, uh, well, I'm doing it. I have a general surgery credential, though, as well as I'm a coding instructor, and I do have that credential as well. Now, how did I obtain my uh, surgical credential, to be honest with you? Um... I obtained my certification, my surgery certification, through beta testing when they were beta testing this, the specialty credentials. So that's how long I've been. I've been in coding. I was coding before they even came up with specialty coding credentials. So when they were testing these credentials, um, they invited me to sit for the surgery credential to t to, to to take the test and determine, provide feedback. So when I sat for the test, I went to the conference and I sat for the test and I passed. And so because I passed, they granted me the credential of the general surgery coder. So um, and then, of course, with the, the instructor, that was something I wanted to do or I felt like I needed to have because I had been tutoring individuals. I had been mentoring individuals. I had been training individuals. Long before I had the um, instructor's uh, credential through AAPC. So I felt like, okay, I, I'll go ahead and get that just to solidify what I'm doing. But did I need that? No, I did not need that. But again, um, I'm glad I got it because, it, again, it solidifies what, I, what I'm doing. I wouldn't be on here sharing with you this information and being able to uh, have a course for individuals to prep for the certification exam. So it is important, um, I guess, to get a certification, but I guess in my case, it's, it's not required. And so I'm able to get coding roles, coding positions. One, uh, one, like I said, I've been in coding for many years 
And secondly, I have a vast amount of work experience as well. And so, and then I have uh, individuals or, or colleagues or, you know, companies I work for that can validate or vouch for my work experience. So that is something, too, that you can look into. Perhaps you worked in a, in, uh, and this is for those who are currently working in Cone Rose. Maybe you're looking to get a promotion or you're looking to, you know, go into a different um role, uh, just make sure, you know, network, you know, make sure uh, you have someone such as your manager or someone in leadership who can vouch or validate for your work experience and your skill set. So again, so again, the takeaways are just making sure you um, reflect professionalism in your work, Making sure you have the skill set or the work experience to complete the task or the role that you're applying for. Networking and re remember to have the, certif the main certification, but you don't need all of the certifications. So I hope you find this information helpful. And so um, as we proceed, if we have any additional information or if I have any addi additional information to share with you, that can help you get to your next level in coding, I will be sharing this on the podcast. And also visit our website and our blog as I share information and tips on, on that site as well. And that is at www.abrahammedicalcodingcoachllc.com. Again, that's www.abrahammedicalcodingcoachllc.com. And so until next time, you all have a great week.